Tonight's talk uh, will be given by Bob Harris. Bob Harris is a lichen enthusiast. Uh, and a lot of us are, but we don't know much about them. But after tonight, we'll know more about them. And he's a citizen scientist. In the last 18 months, he's been involved in a lichen survey at Van Berger Ranch, uh, which is going to be an interesting uh, thing. And I hope he talks a little bit about that. Okay, during Bob's talk, which is going to start shortly, uh, we ask you to do three things. Uh, one, keep your video off uh, so that it doesn't use up bandwidth. Uh, second is to keep your audio off so we don't hear that wonderful dog you have barking in the background that, and also saves bandwidth, I suppose. And if you have questions, you should uh, use the chat function that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, put the questions, uh, type the questions in, uh, and when Bob's talk is over, I'll, I will read uh, through and ask Bob those questions uh, for you. So it'd be great if you would do it that way. And uh, without further, uh, 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 my taking it further time, uh, here's Bob. He's going to uh, give his presentation here and see if I can get out of this. So make sure I can do this. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to stop, okay, stop saving. So, so there's Bob. Uh, can you hear me, Fred? I can hear you. Okay, okay. Okay, well, uh, thank you for that introduction. So that's something uh, that I won't have to go through now. <laughs> so uh, we can just go ahead and get started. And uh, why don't we go ahead and flip to that third screen, third slide. Yeah, yeah, right there. Uh, all right, lichens uh, cover about 7% uh, of the Earth's surface. They're fungi with algae or cyan cyanobacteria living together as one organism. There are no strict rules about those relationships. Some fungi and some algae cannot live without their specific partner, and others can. Some have only green algae, some have only uh, blue-green algae, which are cyanobacteria, and some have both. There are tens of thousands of fungi that can partner with a couple hundred algal species. Because there are so many more fungal species in, in uh, lichens and the algae, their classification is based on the characteristics of, of the fungal partner. And, and the uh, the lichen organism is classified in the uh, fungi kingdom. Uh, if you go to slide four, next slide. <clears throat> okay, lichens uh, can survive drought, freezing, and flooding, so they can be observed, observed any time of year, regardless of the weather. So you can go out any, any time of day, any day of the year, and find something really interesting to observe and enjoy. Excuse me, Bob. Uh, folks say you, uh, they have a hard time hearing you. If you could turn up your volume a little bit. I'll say that again. Uh, some, some folks are having trouble hearing you. If you could turn your volume up a little bit. Okay, let me see. Uh, I think that's about, about that's about as loud as I can, about as loud as I, I can get it. Seems fine to me. Let's see. Yeah, that's uh, that's about as loud as I can get it right now, Fred. Uh, okay, I think you're okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see, where was I here? Um, uh, I'll just start again here. Lichens uh, can survive drought, freezing, and flooding, so they can be observed any time of the year, regardless of the weather. So you can go, go out any time of the day, any day of the year, and find something interesting to observe and enjoy. But if you want to do more than observe, the tools for collecting are easy to get. 
All you need is a, a heavy duty knife, a hammer and wood chisel, pruners to get the lichen from the bark, branch or wood of the tree. A uh, rock chisel or hammer uh, will be needed for collecting lichens on rock and uh, a hand lens, stereo microscope, optical microscope will be needed for making observations to the species level. Uh, you can use paper bags to bring the specimens home. Uh, next. <clears throat> lichens can be found in virtually every terrestrial environment and even underwater, in desert, tundra, jungle or prairie, in trees, rocks, and uh, on soil. Next. Uh, the colors may be shades of gray to black, like the Lechinella nigritella on the left, or brown, green, or yellow, like the uh, Acherospora on the right. Next. Or they can be orange, like this Calaplaca. Next. Or they can be uh, red, like uh, this perennula or cryptothesia on these trees. Next. The dual body of the lichen is called its thallus. They, they come in four basic shapes. Fruticose lichens are shrubby, uh, ramelina and cladidonia, which is uh, the ramelina is on the top left, cladidonia is on the uh, top right. Uh, and the upper photos are highly specialized fruticose lichens that appear very different from the crustose on the left and squamulo on bottom left and squamulose, uh, which are scale like lichens in the lower photo on the right. Uh, however, their basic lichen characteristics in common, they're constructed in specific layers. Uh, next. The thallus has an upper cortex layer, an algal or photobiont layer, uh, the medulla, and sometimes a lower cortex. Uh, the upper cortex of each species has a variety of different features, but folio species are the only ones that have a lower cortex. This diagram is still a good model to start with. The cortex is a layer of densely packed fungal hyphae. The medulla is more loosely packed hyphae. The lower cortex of foliose lichens has attachments called rhizines, or may have one single attachment. But crustose, squamulose, and Next. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this is a real life photo uh, that's depicting the previous diagram. The upper cortex protects the algae from drying out and it's transparent allowing sunlight to pass through it for the algae to uh, photosynthesize. The fungal fibers in the medulla are loosely woven and hydrophobic, allowing them to store water between them and yet pass it on to the al algae as needed. The lower cortex would keep the medulla from drying out below, but in species that have no, no lower cortex, the medulla actually grows into the substrate and can absorb water and minerals from it. Uh, next. These spiky structures are rhizines on the lower cortex that attach foliose lichens to their substrate. They may be simple or highly branched. Next. 
This is an usnea on the left and a teleschistes on the right. They're good examples of fruticose lichens. They're attached by a single base and stand upright or hang down. They're usually somewhat cylindrical and branching. Spanish moss and ball moss that grow on trees in Texas are commonly mistaken for lichens, but they're actually flowering plants in the pineapple family. Uh, Spanish moss, <coughs> Tillandsia usnoidea, is so named because it resembles lichens in the genus Usnea. Teleschistes, the one on the right, you see a lot, uh, particularly in oak trees on the twigs. Um, next. Folios lichens are loosely attached to the substrate and are more leaf or lobe-like. They have both upper and lower surfaces and are attached to the substrate by rhizomes or other types of attachments. They're associated with their lower cortex. The dermatocorpon lichen on the left has an umbilicus in the center of the thallus that holds it on rather than rhizomes <coughs> that attach the parmatrema lichen on the right to its substrate. Next. Crustos lichens, they are held very close to the substrate and some are held within the substrate by their medullary hyphae. <clears throat> they appear to be painted on, on the, the rock or wood substrates. Next. Crustos lichens that are broken into discrete patches or tiles are called areolate. These are in the general Pleopsidum and Buellia. Next. Squamulose lichens are scale-like lobes. Most appear to have a smooth, light-colored lower cortex, which you can see because it is not held as close to its substrate as a crustose lichen. <clears throat> but the attachment fibers are just as tightly matted layer of the medulla. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> they may be oriented horizontally with the substrate, <clears throat> like the sora on the left, or be attached upright with only one <coughs> attached to the substrate, like on, on the cladonia on the right. Squamulose lichens may have sexual spore producing apothecia directly on the squamules. <coughs> as on the left, those little red structures. Or they may be on the top of the tall structures called pedicia, as in the cladonia on the right. <clears throat> Next. Speaking of sexual reproduction, most lichens are classified in the ascomycetes group of sac fungi. So their sexual spores are produced inside sacs called asci. These sacs are in what is called apothecia. Sometimes there is algae in the lower part of the <coughs> apothecia, like in this photo. You can see the, the green algae on, <coughs> on the bottom. Um, and sometimes there's not. But, uh, uh, next. <clears throat> but you can't see these characteristics or these microscopic spores out in the field. So for now, we'll try to uh, stick to macroscopic identification. Next. If the ascoma appears to be attached on top of the thallus, it is called an apothecium. In the squamulose genus Cladonia, the spores may be produced in clearly visible apothecia at the tip or on the rim of a cup. Uh, next. <clears throat> Another type of reproductive apothecia is stalkless, but still prominent like these apothecia directly on the thallus surface of this uh, Xanthoria species. 
see you see this a lot on trees. Uh, next. <clears throat> Parathesia are a type of ascoma that is buried in the cortex, like this varicaria. Uh, and this, this is a sexual structure like the apathesia, it's just kind of inside out. Uh, <clears throat> and next. <clears throat> as far as asexual repro reproduction is concerned, pycnidia are tiny black pockets which are dots in the cortex that produce asexual fungal spores. And they're the little black dots that you see. They're not those larger structures, which are apothecia. Uh, next. <clears throat> but sometimes those black dots are actually dark blue cephalodia, which are pockets of photosynthesizing cyanobacteria that resemble pinknidia. Cyanobacteria also function in nitrogen fixation for the lichen. Microscope. Uh, next. <clears throat> Incidentally, lichens that, that have uh, cyanobacteria, <coughs> excuse me, as their primary photosynthesizer or photobion are called cyanolichens or jelly lichens. <clears throat> Folios and fruticose lichens have been called jelly lichens because they have a jelly-like texture when they're wet as in the photo on the right. <clears throat> when they are dry, they're very dark and dull, like the one on the left. Again, when in doubt, wet them down. Uh, next. <clears throat> Back to asexual reproduction. Seradia are small powdery clusters of medullary hyphae and algal cells, not spores that are produced on the upper or lower cortex of some lichens like this uh, Xantho Mendoza. <clears throat> they are easily detached and uh, they act to propagate new lichens asexually. Next. Isidia are gross on the surface of the lichen. They contain bits of me <clears throat> medulla with cortex covering it. They're brittle and break off propagating new lichens. Parmatrema, like this one, have them. Next. Pruina are not reproductive structures. They are white to gray, waxy, or powdery coverings or splotches on the thallus in some species. It consists of calcium oxalate crystals formed with, with calcium. <clears throat> the lichen absorbed from the substrate. Sometimes parathesia happen to erupt within the patches, like the brown ones in this uh, yellowish acrospora. So the prune is, uh, is the white stuff that you see on, uh, on, on some of these yellow ones. Uh, next. <laughs> And these are just, just some examples of different types of lichens that you might see. Uh, on the, in the upper left is a script lichen. Uh, on the lower right is a, uh, a reindeer lichen. And there is a lepraria on the bottom left. This is coarsely, uh, it's coarsely granular lichen and uh, in the upper right is a peltula, which is a cyanolichen. Oh, these are just a few that you might see around. Uh, <clears throat> okay, next. And of course, the uh, same rules apply for getting owner's permission to collect lichens as it would for any other plants that you might be interested in. 
uh, <clears throat> that's the last of the uh, that's the last of the slide presentation. I'd like to say one more thing before the uh, before there's questions. Uh, there is there's a book if people are interested called uh, a Lichen Study Guide for Oklahoma and Surrounding States. It's written by a Dr. Sheila Strawn from Oklahoma. This is a uh, it's an excellent general introduction to the uh, study of lichens. It's not a field guide. It's just uh, to the study of lichens. It's concise, it's clear, it's well illustrated, and it is uh, published by the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. I think you can also still get it on Amazon. <clears throat> the same lady is uh, coming out it should be out within a couple of months. It's called the Like and Feel Guide for Oklahoma and Surrounding States, and a lot of the stuff in there will will apply to uh, to Texas. So, you know, if you're interested, you might uh, look look the, go to Brit and look those up. So uh, that concludes the presentation. So, if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to try and answer them. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Bob. Um, the, um, the couple, there's a couple of questions here, and then I, I have a couple of more general ones for you. Uh, the first question was, are uh, ball moss and Spanish moss lichens, or are they related, uh, are they related to lichens? No, no, ball moss and uh, Spanish moss are not related to lichens. They're in the pineapple family, but people often mistake them for lichens. Okay, the other fairly specific question is, uh, uh, where would we find the four examples in slide number 29? Uh, <clears throat> you would find that leprairi in the bottom left, you can, it's most, commonly found, uh, I've seen it mostly in along river banks on, uh, on limestone, shaded, uh, on, on, on shaded uh, limestone. The script lichen on the top left, you would most likely find on smooth bark trees. Uh, the cladonia lichen on the bottom Right, uh, you're you're not you're probably going to have to go farther east in Texas to see that. Uh, there's there's one that you might see, but it's around here. But it's pretty it's pretty rare to find it in, in this in this type of terrain. And the peltula is probably going to be is going to be one that you'll find farther east too you know, farther in, in, in East Texas. Okay. What, what, what are the main ones that we would find here in Central uh, uh, Central Texas? Well, I mean, that, cover, that really covers a lot of territory. Uh, I mean, you'd, it, it's, a, you know, you're gonna find a lot of folios lichens. You're gonna find uh, a lot of crustos lichens. Uh, you'll f you'll find a few of the fruticose lichens. To say, you know, I, I just have to make out a list of uh, different genera, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to be able to answer your question right. and really to do any kind of in-depth identification, you would need a field guide or uh, you, you would need something you know, else to be able to identify these these things to uh, even to the genus level. So, by the way, with uh, I need to get into the, uh, the other questions. But speaking of field guides and, and field work, if if you go out, you need a field guide and probably need a a magnifying glass is going to help a lot. Well, you don't have to worry about a field guide for <laughs> Texas because there isn't one right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, that makes it easy. Uh, there, 
you know, uh, Sheila Strawn, the woman that wrote these, those two books I was telling you about, um, is coming out with a field guide, like I say, for Oklahoma and surrounding states and a lot of the, the, the stuff in there will apply to Texas. So I'm, I'm hoping that'll be out pretty soon, but there's just not a lot of, the matter of fact, there's not any literature at all for, uh, for Texas or really for Oklahoma or, or the surrounding states right now. Okay, yes. uh, thank you. Uh, here's a series of questions and these are kind of, they're from different people and they're, they're, there's no, uh, no, no sequence here, so we'll probably pop around. Uh, is there a history of using lichen uh, for, uh, for medicinal purposes? Yeah, they they have been used for medicinal purposes in the past. I think they still use them in some cultures. Uh, <clears throat> they, they're currently being tested to see if they have antibiotic properties. I think Guzni is one that they're particularly interested in. Um, their, their big use nowadays, I mean, they've, they've had a number of uses in the past, but the big use now, nowadays is, is as a pollution indicator. Oh. Uh, they're, they're much che cheaper and more accurate than, you know, sensors are. <laughs> now, they okay. just absorb everything. So uh, they're, great for, uh, they're great for that. And some are gonna be more sensitive than others. Uh, right, yeah, so some, yeah, exactly. Uh, here's a related question. How fast or slow do lichens grow? They grow very slowly. Uh, a millimeter, maybe a couple of millimeters a year. Uh, they can live to be hundreds, even thousands of years old, uh, but they're very slow growing. Uh, <coughs> okay, that's... That's very slow. Uh, are there lichens that are endangered? You know, I don't know of any here in Texas that are endangered. You know, there just hasn't been a whole lot of research done on lichens in general. Uh, there might be some that, that are endangered, uh, but if there are, I'm not aware of them. I haven't seen any literature on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. How did you get interested in lichens? Well, <laughs> you know, honestly, I, I, I really don't remember. They've just always been a source of fascination for me. And, uh, I, you know, there wasn't any one particular thing that, that kicked me on the lichens, uh, they've just always interested me. Okay, uh, that's a good, that's, that's, that makes sense. Uh, what is the difference between the squamulose and the crust, uh, crustulose uh, lichen? Well, the, scromu the squamulose lichens are, are scale-like. You know, I mean, you can see definite scales on them. Okay. You know, they look like a, I guess you could say maybe they look like a snake or something. As far mm -hmm. as their their texture is concerned, whereas a, a crustose lichen is it's like a crust. I mean, it's it's just like a smooth crust, or it can be a, a granular crust, but it's it's crustose. Uh, okay. So this is related to the four lichens we were looking at before. What is the, what is the substrate for these four lichens? Okay, which which ones? Uh, oh, the, I think those these four. four lichens here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the uh, the script lichens on the upper left, that would be on bark. Um, I I've never seen it on rock. Uh, it, it's it's mainly uh, you'll find it on on bark, smooth bark. The one on the left. Uh, that lepraria is a granular crustose lichen. You'll find it, you can find it on trees, uh, you can find it on rocks. It's usually in, in, in a shady area, 
you know, <clears throat> a stream bed or, uh, uh, you know, on, on, a, on a tree that's, that's, that's shaded, that the bark is shaded on. And that uh, Cladonia on the right, <coughs> you'll find that farther east in Texas. Uh, now you will, you might you might find some some you might find some of that. Excuse me, that's not at Cladonia. I don't believe that's in Usnia. At any rate, you'll find that you can find that in trees, on twigs, and, and on limbs, and. Uh, that one, that palpula, which is on the upper right, you would find that on <clears throat> on uh, on trees also. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a lot of this stuff, you know, lichens are on soil also. There's a lot of lichens on soil, and all of these, you know, you really have to look for for a lot of this stuff. You you know. Everybody has seen these uh, uh, red and and yellow lichens that are on rocks and and whatnot. But uh, most of these, you you just have to kind of look for them because you you're just going to skip over them if you don't. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a lot of questions here. Um, wh what is the ecological function of lichens? Well, they they are, <clears throat> like I say, they're used as pollution indicators. That that's their big that's their big function, really, as as far as the uh, ecology is concerned. Uh, you know, they're very good indicators of whether you have too much. Uh, if you're having acid rain or. Uh, <clears throat> any sort of industrial uh, sulfur dioxide pollution, you know, this is going to affect the, the lichens in, in the area. You know, some of them, there's a few that thrive in it, but uh, a lot of them, it kills them or, or uh, uh, you know, it harms them in some way. But that's their main, that's really the, the, the main function of them nowadays. They're also used in, uh, well, it's not an ecological use, but they're used in some perfumes. Um, you know, they're, they're used as these little uh, shrubby bushes on railroad, uh, you know, model railroad trains and that type of thing. Okay. Here's an interesting related question. Uh, it's one I thought about too. Uh, is there a method of encouraging lichens on stones and bricks in our respective yards. So <clears throat> if you wanted to have that lichen look, uh, is there a way to encourage that to happen? I guess about the only thing that you could do, you know, you could get stones that have lichens on them and maybe put that in your, around your gardens, but you can't really grow them. I mean, there's never been any there's ne never been any real success with culturing these things, uh, you know. <clears throat> so that would be my, uh, my my best advice for something like that is just to gather rocks with with these crustose lichens on them. Okay. I think I think you said that some fungi can exist independently, uh, either independently or as lichens. What determines whether whether a particular fungi chooses one of the, one of the lifestyles or another? Whether it finds a compatible algae or not, that's what determines that. Okay. So a, a, a good a good working partner. Uh, right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. There, there was a photo of an oak, I think, twig on the introductory slide. Could you describe what's uh, what's on it? Uh, it kind of looks like uh, what we see around here sometimes. Um, let's see. Do you, you have the slide handy? Uh, uh, that's, that's up to Can you do that, Joan? 
No, because I don't, you have, it's on your, um, your PowerPoint that you gave. It should be the last slide. Do you still have it open? Uh, no, I don't have it. I, I don't have it uh, in front of me. No, I, well, I was hoping that Fred was able to pull it up on his machine, on, oh. on the PowerPoint. Just share your screen with the last slide. Can you do that? I don't think, I don't have, I don't have his PowerPoint. No, it was, it was the last slide of the introduction when you introduced him. Uh, oh, is it? Yeah. Uh, is that, is that, that what was they a slide that Lee took. Okay, so this one. Okay, let me see if I can. Uh, this, this isn't without his problem, but let's see if I can do that. Um, uh, that one? Yeah, that's it. Okay, well, and what, what was the question now? What is that? <laughs> That's the essence of the question, I think. That that is looks like the it's it's the parmatrema, the, the leafy ones, or that's what it looks like. It looks like a parmatrema, what they call a parmatrema. Um, and then there's one kind of hanging down from the bottom there that might be an usnea. Well, but there's okay. a number of wow. different species of, of these things and it, it would be hard for me to say what species it is just by looking at it okay uh, you know these these things as far as their species are concerned or even the genus a lot of times they, these are microscopic characteristics uh, i mean a lot of times what separates for example one uh, one species in a genus from another is the, the size of the spores or uh, the, the uh, <clears throat> color of the spores. So, okay. you know, it's just, it's, it's just difficult to say that's a particular species right there. So, so when we look at this, it, it looks like, if, if I looked at this as somebody who knows very, very little about this, I would guess there's a couple of different species there, but I, I don't know that's true. Yes, it looks like there's several different species there. Uh, and the, those are foliose lichens. And uh, um, they look like a, a genus called Pormatrema. But I, I wouldn't, I, I can't say that for sure, but that's what it looks like. Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to put that away and try to go back to the questions if I can here. Uh, and here's a question. Uh, it's a good one. What lichens do we usually see on live oaks? I would say that uh, lichens that you would most well, likely see on live oak would be, you would see usnea, you're gonna see this on the twigs. I mean, you're gonna have to, you know, you, you're gonna have to look up at the, and, and try to find this fruticose uh, lichen called usnea. And uh, <clears throat> there's also one called teleschistes, which was, uh, also part of the presentation, it had those little red cups. Um, it's a uh, it's a fruticose lichen, like like Usnea. They're both fruticose lichens. You're going to find um, a number of uh, crustose lichens, and you're going to find a number of. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Folios lichens, hmm. different, different genuses, and in order, in order to identify those 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 genuses, uh, like say you're, you're going to have to get a book. Oh, like uh, lichens of North America, which which is a, right. uh, you're going to have to want to study lichens in order to uh, look through that book for them. 
So, so there's another question that we, we kind of, you, you touched on this before, is the presence of lichens an indication of good air quality? But, so, but the bigger question is why are there more lichens someplace than others? It kind of seems, I used to think it was, it had to do with the moisture content, but clearly you see lichens in very dry areas also. But, but what kind of determines whether lichens seem to be uh, uh, much more present? Well, <clears throat> lichens are kind of like us. They like <clears throat> the weather that they like best is cool and moist. So out on the East Coast, for example, you're going you're to find a lot more variety and a lot more quantity, uh, you know, in the Northeast or right, right. really any place on the East Coast. Uh, down here, you're not going to to have the you're just not going to have that variety and uh, that quantity just because of the temperature and the humidity and whatnot. But you'll have more in East Texas than you're going to have around here. Okay, could, could you make it, make it clear for, uh, for us beginners that the, the relationship between lichens and mosses? So I was thinking when I used to hike a lot in the Northeast, I would see lots of lichens and lots of mosses as some variety of each of those. But uh, is, could you uh, delineate the, the, the connection between those? Well, there's, I mean, lichens and mosses are, are two entirely different organisms. Um, you know, a moss is, is classified in the plant kingdom. And a lichen is classified in the fungi kingdom. And, you know, it's a fun, it's a combination of a fungi and an algae. I mean, there there is no there, there is no connection really uh, between a a moss and a lichen. They're just two entirely different things. But I was thinking they seem to like the same environment to some degree. Oh yeah, yeah, they do. They yeah, they they would like the same environment. Uh, you're going to find mosses primarily in moist environments, whereas lichens you're going to find everywhere. You know, they're, they're going to be in, in deserts or they're, they're going to be in the tundra. They're going to be everywhere. Right. Whereas mosses are, you know, like I say, mostly in, you know, the wetter the area is, the more mosses you're going to find. Okay. Here's a different kind of question. Uh, when did lichens first appear in uh, Earth history, before or after flowering plants? Are they more primitive earlier? I'm not necessarily more primitive than earlier. Uh, they, they think that they appeared before the land plants did. Okay. Yeah, they, this, which would have been I believe it. I believe it's. They're one of the first. They're one of the first evolutionary organisms that they think appeared on land. The cyanobacteria and the uh, and the fungi are among the oldest things you're going to find. Evolutionarily uh, speaking, you know. Are there any insect or animal interactions or the animal interactions such as uh, with lichens? So uh, are they eaten by any, uh, are they eaten by any, uh, spe any animal species, I guess is the question. Yeah, they're, you know, reindeer like those cladonia that we call uh, reindeer lichens <coughs> or reindeer moss rather. <coughs> okay. Actually lichens. And then there's a lot of there's a lot of insects that uh, that do eat them or try to eat them. Um, I can't tell you exactly what kind of insects, but uh, you know there there are insects that eat them, and they're used by <clears throat> they're used by birds as uh, you know for feathering their nests um, and that type of thing. So, so what about lichens? What are they? 
what do they use for their nourishment? Are they breaking at, if they're sitting on a tree bark? Are they are they consuming part of that bark? Or are they breaking down rocks? Or uh, what is they, do, they do break down rocks. All the all the lichens produce organic acids, and uh, you know part of it is for protect, protection from insects and whatnot, and. Uh, Part of it is, you know, for the uh, for the lichens, particularly the ones that live on rocks, they they do uh, produce acids that break down the rocks, and uh, eventually, you know, you produce soil. But uh, yeah, they they do break they do break down uh, the rocks. Are they damaging trees that they're on? No, no. <laughs> uh, I've read in some places that people think that they might uh, damn it. You know, if if a tree was just totally covered with lichens, uh, you could make a case for uh, you know the the tree not getting full sunlight or something. But uh, no, they're they don't they're they're not considered to. Uh, to harm the trees that they're on. Okay, here's another interesting question. Is Nostoc really a cyanolichen? Yes, uh, Nostoc is not a lichen itself. Uh, Nostoc is a cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria, now, not a lichen. It combines with some lichens. Okay. But it's, it's not a lichen itself. You know, it, it, it can live on its own or it can live with the, with the fungi. Okay, let's see. Uh, is is an interesting question. What is the largest lichen? The largest lichen. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that I. Uh, I'm not sure that I can answer that. I mean, would would that be? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what the largest lichen would be. Uh, I don't know how you could even really determine that, you know. Uh, would that be by the area that it would cover or, uh, you know, how, you know, it couldn't, couldn't be based on how tall it was. Uh, you just have to break it down a little farther than uh, what's the biggest lichen, I guess. Here's something that here's something you may not be uh, uh, conversant with, but is there a lichen project on iNaturalist? Well, there there are lots of uh, you know like bio blitzes, for example, where they'll put uh, you know lichens on iNaturalist. Uh, there's there's no overall project that I'm aware of on on uh, iNaturalist uh, that is strictly for lichens. Now there might be, but I'm not aware of it. Uh, let's see. Here's a, here's a question. Are there any lichens that are poisonous to the touch? And the, the, the and associated question, are there any uh, they use for food in any parts of the world? There are lichens in some parts of the world that are used for food, but it, they have to be really boiled for a long time in order to make, make them uh, edible. <coughs> and they're, they're, I understand they you know, will use those in salads and whatnot. Uh, <coughs> like I say, they're, they're, they're not chock full of vitamins uh, or, or nutrients. It's not some, something that you would normally want to eat. Um, now there, and as far as being poisonous, there, there are, they can poison you if there's, there's certain lichens that are poisonous, but there hasn't been done that much research on which ones are and which ones aren't. There's one called a wolf lichen that they used to use for poisoning wolves. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't know if they still do that anymore, but uh, 
uh, yeah, it's not something that you would, most people would choose to eat. You know, if you were right. starving to death, you might. And, and gr growing on a millimeter a year, you know, is not going to be a big farming occupation. Wouldn't, uh, <laughs> hard to make a living off it. Um, here's, a, here's a question, uh, which I'm uh, see whether it's possible for you to do it. Uh, so uh, could, you, could you go over, uh, let me see, where, where is the question? Could you go over the structure of lichen slide again? Uh, can you pop that up and go over that? John, this slide here? Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Yeah, and that <clears throat> that upper layer is the uh, upper cortex. That's the one with the ascoma, with uh, the apothecium on it. And that middle, the middle layer is the uh, algal layer. The, the algal cells are those little round things there. And mm -hmm. the medulla. Okay. Is, is the rest of the, uh, the it's the fun, fungi medulla that the uh, algae are, are wrapped in, and they the uh, the medulla the high the the fungal hyphae feed off of those. They can kind of punch into those uh, algae cells and extract nourishment from them. And then the lower cortex <clears throat> is what's going to be in contact with the substrate, and it's just another, it's it's just another texture of lichen, <clears throat> and uh, some lichens have rhizines, and they can kind of get into the cracks of uh, rocks and trees and whatnot, <clears throat> and uh, some of them the just just the medulla, medullary hyphae just latch on onto the uh, substrate itself. Is that, is that what you were interested in? Is that? Uh, I, think, I, think that I think that's it, yes. Uh, hope, I hope that helps. By the way, you mentioned that some lichens have cilia. What, what are the cilia actually, what's the function of them, of the cilia? Uh, yeah, some lichens, uh, do have cilia and they think that it might give more area, uh, it, that, that it might help them to uh, latch onto the substrate. That's, that's the best explanation that I've seen for them. It, you know, it, it just gives them uh, a better ability to uh, like say to latch on onto the, whatever substrate that they happen to be on. Then I, th then I think the final question here is, uh, I, I think we touched on this, but I'm not sure we nailed down this part of it. Uh, is the question is, is the oldest living organism a lichen? I've never heard that. I've never heard about the oldest living organism being a lichen. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it certainly could be, um, but I, I've never, I've never read anything on that. Okay. Here, here's, here's a, uh, here's, uh, I got a further comment about <clears throat> the cilia question. So the, the cilia question was uh, in reference to the fruiting body, the cilia on the fruiting body. Okay, well, uh, what, what was the question on it? Uh, so what's the function of the cilia on the fruiting body of the lichen? There's, there are only a few species of lichen that you're going to see cilia around the, uh, the apothecia. And I really don't know what, what function that, that they would be for. Okay. Very few species. That, that, matter of fact, I only know of one that uh, I've ever seen cilia on. 
Okay, it's actually a, a kind of a final, a final question, I think. Uh, if, I, if I wanted to buy a, a guide of some kind that would help me when I'm out trying to identify lichens, so would, what, would, what specific book would you recommend? <clears throat> that is, <laughs> there really isn't anything that you can take into the field with you uh, for the lichens around here. I mean, there just hasn't been that much research done on them. Um, you know, like I say, there's, uh, you know, Sheila Strawn in Oklahoma is coming out with a field guide for Oklahoma and surrounding states. And when that comes out, you'll have something. Otherwise, you just have to go out and collect them. And then you, you get a book, for example, like uh, Lichens of North America. Okay. And you, just have to learn how to use that. And uh, I mean, if you're gonna really get into identifying lichens, you really need to go to some sort of a workshop somewhere um, because they're not easy to identify and you're gonna have to have a, you're gonna have to have a dissecting microscope and an optical microscope in order to get, get down to the species level and even a lot of times to get down down to the genus level. <laughs> so, so what would you guess here? Okay, I kind of asked this, but I'm going to ask it in a more specific way. If 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 I went out and and did that, how many how many different species would I be likely to find in the San Antonio area? I don't know how many species in the San Antonio area. Pro I would I would say probably between uh, seventy and a hundred, maybe. Okay. I've I've, uh, I've collected extensively in Hayes County, and over about the past uh, seven years, and I have about seventy from Hayes County. Okay. So. I'm assuming that uh, the San Antonio area would probably be pretty close to that. So you could probably find between 70 and 100 uh, different types in, in the San Antonio area. Okay, great. Uh, th 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 very interesting uh, topic and very interesting answers to these uh, wonderful questions. I, I appreciate everybody uh, participating and I very much uh, thank you for being here. And I want to once again, make the correction on the, if you want to volunteer to help with the plant sale, I kind of misspelled it on the slide there. It's actually a Nipsot San Antonio volunteers. I left the SR volunteers at gmail.com. Thank you very much. We're all now giving you a good uh, hand clapping here and appreciate uh, your coming, Bob. But it's uh, very enlightening. This is something that many of us knew very little about. Okay, thank you. And everybody else, we'll see you all uh, next uh, month uh, or we'll see you uh, at other events coming up. Thank you very much.